Uh, kia ora tato, no mai, haere mai, ko Brett O'Reilly toko inua. Uh, I'm Brett O'Reilly. Um, I'm the chief executive in my day job of the Employers and Manufacturers Association, uh, and I'm also one of New Zealand's uh, three uh, APEC Business Advisory Council uh, members um, and uh, returned on Sunday, along with some of the people on the panel today, uh, from uh, from a week in San Francisco at, uh, at ABAC4 and at the APEC um, CEO Summit and, uh, and APEC Dialogue. So look, thank you for joining us today. We've got a stellar uh, panel and I'll introduce them um, as they come up uh, to talk. But let me just um, start with some, some opening comments about our, um, uh, our panel today. I always love um, being in this fale. I think it's, um, it's an incredible venue. And when you look at the traditional way uh, that it's constructed, um, it's you know a series of interlocking pieces which actually make a structure that uh, that's that's pretty incredible. And in a way, that's that's um, a good analogy to the trade system um, because um, it's about trying to build a um, a system that interlocks. Uh, sometimes it looks quite good on the outside, but it's a little bit different in its construction. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, about that today. And um, when we were uh, when we were in San Francisco last week, um, uh, one of the one of the probably most inspiring speakers that I found was Con Condoleezza Rice, um, who many of you will be familiar with. Uh, and Condoleezza said during her um, she was interviewed by um, uh, by prominent um, uh, business journalist and. Uh, one of the quotes I took from her presentation was, globalisation is a fact, not a policy. And I think, you know, when I reflect back, I've been involved in, in, uh, in trade issues since uh, the mid-1980s when I worked in the Beehive um, for the Muldoon and then the Longy governments. And, um, and, and that was really, um, you know, we just, we just passed CER and we began... Um, the, the, the rounds of trade talks led by my old boss, um, uh, the late Mike Moore, um, around uh, freeing up trade in, in uh, many of the, the, uh, the products that uh, are valuable to New Zealand and still are today in terms of agriculture, and then expanded into other areas over a period of time. And that, that's been a long uh, and um, painstaking process, but um, if we reflect on it 40, you know, almost 40 years later, um, the results for New Zealand have been incredible, um, and particularly in our ability to diversify an economy that up until then had been largely reliant on a, um, on a single market, um, the United Kingdom, um, and after their entry into the European economic community, as it was then called in the 1970s, New Zealand had to find a different way of making, uh, making our way in the world and trade has been the, the single thing that has underpinned that. So we're going to cover a lot of those, um, those, uh, those things today. While globalisation might be a fact, it's definitely under threat. And as we, as we see the rise of nationalism, we see the, the, um, the concerns about um, uh, you know, particular countries having, uh, having dominance, sometimes in particular sectors, sometimes in particular regions, it presents a whole lot of new challenges for us in that um, uh, in, in that endeavour, and uh, and you'll hear that from from our uh, our panelists today. New Zealand plays um, a really important part in that global system, and I just wanted to reflect on that a little bit um, before I introduce our first speaker. You know, you hear the cliche a lot that you know New Zealand punch above, punches above its weight, but when it comes to trade uh, policy, we absolutely do. We have led many of the initiatives. I might have said most, but I won't be that, uh, I won't be that bold. We've led many, maybe if not most, of the major trade initiatives that, uh, uh, that, that the world has seen uh, since 1984. Um, and we continue to be very active in, uh, in those activities. If I reflect on um, my 12 months of being directly involved with ABEC, having, having had a peripheral involvement over the years, um, as, a, as a smaller nation, we are able to, to um, navigate our path between some of the larger nations and between some of the larger issues. 
Uh, my role, um, or one of my roles as part of the APEC Business Advisory Council is to lead the climate change work stream, um, which is obviously critical of critical importance given the existential crisis that we face. And, uh, and as part of that, um, that work stream, ably assisted by Steph Honey, who you're going to hear from in, in a minute, we, you know, we see our job as being pushing the 21 member economies you know, to do more on climate change than we otherwise would do, because the current, the current uh, record is not great. You know, we got, we're heading in the wrong direction in terms of, um, of emissions reduction. And so one of the initiatives that we pushed, and I was pleased to, to um, say we got accepted, was a communique from ABEC to COP28, uh, which was drafted by Steph, if you don't mind me saying Steph, uh, and, and, uh, and accepted by the other countries, uh, which we believed was a really important that we made that statement on behalf of the, the, um, the business communities in those 21 APEC member economies that it's very clear that we support the, the climate change initiative and we move it forward. So today you're going to hear from four speakers who really are um, outstanding um, practitioners in their part of the, the trade system. Um, and we're going to open the panel by just some brief remarks from each of the panellists um, about, our, uh, about our subject, what just happened and where to next. And, there was, and we could have asked ourselves that question several times uh, last week um, as, we, as we witnessed um, uh, what was happening uh, both within ABAC and APEC and also around the edges because, as usual, there were lots of bilateral meetings. So, I'm, so the uh, first speaker I'm going to introduce is Vangelis Vitalis. Um, he um, probably needs no introduction, but I will. Um, uh, but I'll keep it brief because we want to hear um, about the content. Uh, Van Gillis is New Zealand's lead trade negotiator. He's been doing that role how long now? Van Gillis, ten years? Eight, eight years. Eight years. Okay, I think took over from David Walker um, uh, uh, about the time that we sort of got TPP into the CPTPP state. By the way, there's a competition today um, to, for coming up with a new name for um, for uh, for TPP because uh, CP we we had a CPTPP session, which I'm sure we'll talk about reflect on a bit today. And after um, the speakers had said it for about the 50th time, it gets pretty tricky. So, uh, so chocolate fish uh, for, the, uh, for the person that can come up with the best alternative name for CPTPP today. I'm sure if MFAT's budget can't stretch that, I think that the EMA will, um, uh, will do that. But, but look, Vangelis is at the heart of, of what's happening with, um, with trade globally. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we, we've been busy with, um, with C CPTPP. Um, we also had the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework being discussed and negotiated um, while we were in uh, San Francisco, along with all of the bilateral and other multilateral agreements that New Zealand is part of. So please join me in welcoming Vangelis. Thanks very much, um, Brett. Nice analogy of the, um, of the whale. Um, <laughs> although I don't observe any big holes in it. Um, so that metaphor doesn't apply today to the trade system. So I, I was given five minutes to talk about what, uh, what just happened. So um, I'm going to speak sort of in two parts. One, about what happened, and then some observations about the geopolitics, in particular the US um, hosting, which I think was a really important um, and significant event that we shouldn't lose sight of, that they hosted APEC. Um, and that they really projected themselves into the, uh, into the region. So look, let me start with APEC. Um, so APEC accounts for the, the 21 economies there, account for 80% of our exports, 60% of global GDP, 50% um, of global trade flows. It is a very significant um, body for us. Um, and we think of it in sort of four elements. The first is that commercial aspect. We've got free trade agreements with um, all but two of the APEC members. Um, they are Russia is one and the United States is the other. Uh, go figure how, how that can be explained. Um, and so we have that commercial aspect. Uh, then we say uh, it's an incubator of good ideas. So if you think about many of the things that we picked up in our trade agreements, they have their origin in, uh, in APEC. So uh, rules of origin, customs facilitation procedures, all of the the elements that are so critical to um, businesses to trade internationally 
a lot of those components started off as guidelines, as norms, as principles, and then eventually, in some cases more than a decade, they, they come into our trade agreement. So a very important incubator um, for those good ideas. The third thing that APEC does that's very significant is it's obviously it's convening power. It is the only place that um, a New Zealand Prime Minister can meet um, the leader of the United States, the leader of China, leader of Indonesia, right through to um, His Royal Highness from um, Brunei. So it, it, this convening power of APEC is very significant. Also not to be forgotten is the fact that APEC hosts whoever is chairing that year can invite people. So the President of Colombia was there, for example, um, and so you get this additional convening element to APEC. Um, and finally, the really important part also that happens at APEC is what you can do in the margins, so the APEC-adjacent events. Uh, and they were clearly this time CPTPP uh, and IPEF. And so a couple of words on that before I turn to the, um, in my remaining minute or so. Um, maybe to say that, for, just to go back to APEC, so APEC had a pretty tough year. Uh, we, we didn't get any agreed statements, no consensus on statements. This is the, the key thing for every APEC host, is to get consensus. Um, didn't get that all year, but we got it right at the end. Um, so foreign ministers and trade ministers agreed a statement by consensus, and leaders also agreed a statement by, by consensus. And I think significantly too, we have one of those good ideas that got incubated. It's the San Francisco Principles for Sustainability and Inclusion. So a really interesting set of elements um, there that offer guidelines and principles that support very much the Aotearoa Plan of Action, which was APEC 2021's big achievement. Um, so nicely dovetailing with the work that we did in 2021 that the US has now um, put their shoulder to and we all agreed to. So, so great that we got consensus and I think that was the hallmark of a lot of hard US diplomacy, a lot of challenges in those last few hours, but really good to have that and also to have something substantive to, uh, to point to at the end of it. Then we had CPTPP, so, um, and I, I know we've got colleagues here who worked on that. Uh, CPTPP ministers met, Minister O'Connor chaired, because we're the host this year, we're the chair. Um, the significant thing that came out of that was an agreement by the 12 of us, which of course now includes the United Kingdom, to launch a review of the agreement. In other words, we agreed a set of uh, terms of reference to launch that review uh, next year. If you think about where we were at the start of the year, which is uh, we were short on members having ratified, uh, there was certainly, you know, in speaking as the chair, there was certainly no consensus uh, to move to an upgrade of the agreement. In fact, by my count at the start of the year, only three economies were really firmly in favour of, of an upgrade. So the fact that we were able to bring that together and move it forward at, uh, with Minister O'Connor's chairing, I think is a very um, significant step uh, into CBTP. On IPF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, this is the US flagship initiative that projects them into the region. It has four pillars, uh, a trade pillar, a supply chains pillar, a fair economy pillar, and a clean economy pillar. Uh, three of those uh, were concluded, so the supply chains pillar was um, signed. Uh, so a very significant element of that is it has a crisis response mechanism where the 14 members, including, by the way, India, would come together uh, and work on supply chains this year if we have the same kind of crisis that we had during COVID. You can imagine for a small economy like ours how important that kind of mechanism, that kind of institutional structure is to help us manage uh, some of the challenges that are out there. Then we have the clean economy and the fair economy. Essentially those two pieces, one is about decarbonisation and attracting investment and trade facilitation into economies to help decarbonise. And on the fair economy, a range of sort of anti-corruption, anti-money laundering commitments, again designed to give business some certainty and transparency uh, in the economies that they're working with, investing in and, and trading with. So very important. Um, no secret that um, it was a pity that we were not able to conclude the, the trade pillar. Uh, so this was the, the piece that we'd all um, been very much looking forward to with some substantive elements in there uh, that we were quite excited about, including some real customs facilitation procedures to move products across borders within six hours, that kind of thing that really does have meaning for, um, for business. Unfortunately, and that brings me to the sort of my final set of observations, which is um, US domestic politics intervened. Uh, it was clear that the US did not believe that it could carry um, its domestic politics and support the trade pillar. Uh, the reason given was um, uh, that there were not labor and environment standards of sufficient um, 
a sufficiently high threshold for the United States to feel comfortable, in particular a couple of um, senators who had a real problem um, with that. So uh, a disappointing part of the week was that we were not able to conclude that, but the good thing is that the negotiations continue, that the work will proceed into the next year, uh, and I think very importantly it's again the fact that the US is in the region, so not only hosted APEC, but there's now an institutional mechanism, a platform, that helps keep uh, the United States in the region and creates that building block that we hope eventually will merge into something uh, more, more powerful. Maybe to say also a critical part of last week was um, uh, the China-US uh, bilateral, the President Xi, President Biden bilateral. It's fair to say that we were all waiting the outcome of that to know whether we would be able to get a consensus statement. That was a critical enabler as it always is in APEC. That is that critical moment when the, those two leaders get together and you know whether or not you're going to have a, um, uh, going to be able to secure a consensus. And so that was very positive and this stabilizes uh, around that relationship, which remains obviously still um, uh, reasonably challenging. And finally, um, as always, well, not as always, but as, a, as part of the recent developments in APEC, um, politics intrudes, international politics. So of course, Gaza was to the fore. Uh, no secret that Indonesia and Malaysia in particular were very strong on the need to reflect that situation. And of course, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine continued to feature as part of the discussions. Rather neatly, what happened this year was we got a consensus statement and then there was a chair's statement which covered the geopolitical issues of Russia, Ukraine and, and Gaza. So look, in, in many ways, a, um, a, a real success uh, because of the US hosting, the consensus um, and the events that we had along in the margins. And I should also note that I think very interestingly in terms of the theme of this um, meeting today, uh, there was also the Indigenous Partnership for Economic Trade and Cooperation, the first meeting of the Partnership Council, which is all about the implementation where we have Indigenous reps side by side with government officials. And perhaps just as significant was the fact that the United States hosted a Indigenous dialogue to which New Zealand, Australia and Canada and some others were invited. Um, and again, that's the first time the US has stepped into that space. I can still remember in 2021 how difficult it was to persuade the United States that this was an important area of work. And here they are at this leaders uh, meeting, although it was hosted by Ambassador uh, Tai, US trade representative, um, they hosted a, uh, a specific dialogue on that. So lots, uh, lots that went on um, and lots to, to take out. And of course, some disappointment as well in terms of the, the trade pillar, but um, you know, we keep on. Kia ora Vangelis, um, uh, thank you for mentioning um, IPETCA, um, that was a real highlight for us that um, uh, Indigenous uh, rights and Indigenous trade has been something that we've, uh, that New Zealand's championed really hard um, at, uh, at ABAC and uh, Tracy Hopapa, who is leading that work uh, came and spoke to our ABAC um, uh, session and, and as usual was just simply outstanding and I think um, you, know, it, you know, it's great when you can see that work um, you know, start to come to fruition. Look, our next panellist um, is Sarah Salmon. Sarah is um, a partner at Minter Ellison. Um, Sarah's been a corporate um, lawyer uh, for 20 years, but really is um, a global legal expert on trade. Um, she was named one of New Zealand lawyers' elite women, um, so she made that list in 2023 and she was named Asia Pacific's International Trade Lawyer of the Year at the Women in Business Law Awards in 2023. Um, Sarah is the only lawyer from a major New Zealand firm uh, recognised for trade law by the best lawyers in New Zealand. Um, Sarah's list of expertise is, um, is, is uh, legendary, uh, and we're very fortunate to have someone in, um, in the New Zealand legal fraternity with her level of expertise, and I know it's uh, well utilised by many of, um, uh, of our, um, our exporters and people involved in trade, and indeed many of the people in the room. Sarah, over to you. Thanks very much, Brett, and, and I just can't help but say legal sorority. <laughs> but anyway, look, um, like my friends on the panel this morning, and many of you in the room, I've been working in trade for a long time. Uh, 24 years, 17 years in private practice, and seven years before that in food industry roles with a trade focus. But I started out at MPI doing trade policy in the early 2000s. So, you know, I've got some views on this topic, but I should say primarily from a private sector perspective. 
Um, really, just to summarise what I'm going to say to you in four points. Um, I think multilateral, bilateral and regional trade agreements have done wonders for New Zealand's international trade profile and performance in the last 30 years. But I do think they are not going to be the panacea for New Zealand going forward. As a result, I think our incoming government needs to do a fundamental review of New Zealand's trade policy. And I believe the fundamental objective of this should be to identify trade policy initiatives that are going to deliver the best commercial returns on our collective investment and then she would, we should focus on those because trade policy is not about trade agreements for trade agreements sake, it's about creating commercial opportunity. So to explain those thoughts, look, a large part of New Zealand's impressive performance on the international stage in the past 30 years has been due to, to our government's relentless pursuit of um, multilateral, bilateral and regional trade agreements and they've done wonders for our economy and economic prosperity. And one of the ways they've done that is by reducing or removing foreign tariffs on exports of products from New Zealand. But in my view, and in the view of many trade commentators, particularly there's an excellent paper by John Ballingall of Sense Partners, which I'd recommend to you. Um, I think trade agreements are unlikely to be a panacea for New Zealand in the future. And this is not because all the trade barriers have gone. <laughs> they definitely haven't. You just need to ask all of our friends in the dairy and meat sector but it is because the low and medium hanging market access fruit has been harvested and the trade barriers that remain are going to be extremely difficult to shift via traditional trade agreements. And I appreciate this is a big call. I know there'll be some divergent views on our panel in the room, but I do think the statistics in some way speak for themselves. 65% of our trade already occurs under a free trade agreement. A further 13% of our trade will be under a free trade agreement when the NZEU uh, agreement comes into effect next year and when a NZGCC Golf Cooperation Council deal is done. Which, get your calculator out, leaves you with 22% of our trade, which is not currently under a trade agreement. Half is with the US. An FTA with the US would be amazing, but I think we all know that that is not on the agenda for the Americans right now. The other... 11% of our traders with a long list of trade partners and I think it would be dif difficult to get the New Zealand business community excited about pursuing deals with essentially any of those countries with the exception of India. I think there's a lot of great things we can do with India but a free trade agreement is not realistic in the near term. So to summarise, I think putting aside the potential FTAs with the GCC, the US and India, which New Zealand government officials I'm sure will and should continue to push for, I do not think that further free trade agreements are going to deliver the economy-wide benefits for New Zealand that are going to outweigh the significant costs that are involved in negotiating them. So, if free trade agreements aren't necessarily the panacea for us going forward, what is? This is a really, really big question. Um, we've written an article that's online with some ideas, but I do think the first and most important thing we really should do is our incoming government should do a fundamental review of New Zealand's trade policy. Um, if you chat with Tim Grosser, our former trade minister, he says that we haven't actually done a review of our trade policy through a commercial lens since 1993. I think the primary objective of this exercise should be to contain, to, to get a comprehensive understanding of the non-tariff barriers that New Zealanders face, the regulations and restrictions when operating in third markets. And we need to talk to a broader range of stakeholders. We need to go beyond trade policy experts in traditional sectors. We need to talk to commercial people, people in sales, logistics, IT, and we really need to talk in their language Generally speaking, C-suite corporate New Zealand does not talk in the language of trade officials, so we really need to try and access insights from everyone. And I believe, hopefully, what this review would do would be to enable us to find specific areas where we can really assist and find cost savings and simplifications that can be realistically achieved and realised. And then I think we need to determine a new strategy. It's not a wholly new strategy, but it's a modified strategy to ensure we can best pace New Zealand business on the world stage. So to summarise, I think I believe we are at a critical juncture in terms of our trade policy. We have limited resources. You know, we'd, it would be great to do everything, but we cannot do everything. So I think we really need to determine what is it that we can do that will deliver the very best returns for our investment for New Zealand. Um, and I'm optimistic that we actually can 
um, come up with a modified trade policy. We have, as Brett pointed out, been real trade policy innovators in the past, and I'm confident that we can do that in the future. Kia ora, Sarah. That's a really nice segue um, to our next panellist, uh, Michael Fox. Um, Michael um, wears, like the rest of the panel, many, um, many hats. One of those is as the recently elected chair of the Indian New Zealand Business Council, and Gary Gupta's here today from the Business Council who does an amazing job. Um, we were uh, recently together in India as part of um, a delegation led by, um, uh, by ONZBC, but with support from a number of organisations, including the EMA, Export New Zealand, Auckland Business Chamber, and the New Zealand International Business Forum, which, again, some of the panellists are involved with. Um, and so, uh, Michael, um, uh, I know is going to touch on India as part of his, um, his remarks. Uh, Michael's day job is as the head of global uh, public affairs for Zespri, and Michael's been at Zespri for almost five years. Uh, prior to that, he worked for Simon Bridges when Simon was the leader of the opposition, and before that, worked in the offices of uh, Sir Bill English and uh, Sir John Key. Um, and, uh, and was originally a journalist, as was I. So there you are. Um, uh, we can find our way to different uh, and interesting roles. Please join me in welcoming Michael. Thanks, Brett. And can I acknowledge uh, both your memory, uh, that was great recollection, but also the fact that you're doing this job on one leg. So I um, <laughs> so appreciate you taking the time to do that for us. Uh, so I thought I'd sort of ground my, my comments more in the, I suppose, the specific business environment. So I'll talk a bit about India, but also the context that Zespri uh, and businesses like us are operating in. And, and the reality is that, that that environment is getting more and more complex and complicated. And if you're a business owner and you're thinking, do I want to invest to expand my business? In our context, I should say we are, you know, we, we're sort of, in 2020 we looked at the numbers, we were $4 billion odd dollars in sales then. Our view was based on the level of demand of the market. We can grow that to two or three times by 2030. Uh, but the, but the, the, supply, the, the constraints are all on the supply side. And part of it is willingness to invest and willingness, uh, ability to adapt to that sort of changing global operating environment. So if you're a grower, um, you have uh, a business model which you've operated on um, successfully for many years, but essentially it was turned on its head a couple of years ago by the pandemic, which drove a labour shortage, which ultimately led to half a billion dollars, almost $550 million uh, of fruit that we grew but couldn't sell because of sort of rough picking practices. That takes a lot of value out of the industry. You throw in climate change, we're about 20% down on volume that we thought we would be able to sell this year. Um, so that's about a billion dollars worth of fruit value taken out of the industry, then you consider the fact that your costs are up, you consider the facts that you are operating in a changing regulatory environment in New Zealand, but also offshore. So you're adapting to both re regulatory changes on both sides. And I think, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll relate that to the sort of the trade discussion shortly, but it's a difficult operating environment. And if you're a business person, you're going, can I, do I have the confidence to invest? Can I take this risk? Or is this just adding risk? Um, you, know, is, 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 you know, is the potential benefits outweighed by those risks? So that the business confidence is really uh, constrained at the moment, and you can see that, um, you know, I think across the economy and through all the surveys and these sorts of things. One of the ways that we can rebuild that confidence is through trade agreements. Um, and I think I come back to Zespri. We've been huge beneficiaries of trade agreements. Thank you, Vangeli. Um, so, you know, the Europe agreement's worth 50-odd million dollars a year to us in tariff savings. China's grown from, you know, $20 million in year one to a billion dollars now. Uh, South Korea was essentially a market we were looking to exit. Um, we were paying a significant tariff there, about 50%, I think it was. Um, and, you know, remove the tariff, it's now one of our, both our largest and fastest growing. So, so trade's been a huge enabler of our industry's success. Um, I think, you know, and I, so, you know, that's just in terms of improved market access. But I think if you look at some of these other areas, like you know, you come back to the Europe Agreement, all of those challenges I talked about, how do we feed a growing number of people in a more environmentally friendly manner with fewer tools, because people around the world, governments around the world are regulating at a fast pace. Take Europe, for example, they are saying, you know, they're telling their farmers you need to reduce your pesticide use by 50% and you need to um, you know, reforest 25% of your land. They're not going to impose these restrictions on their farmers and growers, but give everyone else a free for all. So we can expect to start to see some of those um, you know, tariff barriers and restrictions coming our way. Already Europe, uh, Berlin, uh, Germany, for example, is proposing an export ban on 180 agrochemicals because they're saying our farmers and growers can't use them, therefore it's you know, morally wrong to export to the rest of the world. So, so you're starting to see that, and you've already got it through carbon border adjustment mechanisms, targeting heavy industry, but you know, let's sort of see what that trend is. So you go, so we, we have 
the trade agreement with Europe, for example, but it doesn't just enable us to in, in, you know, expand, invest in expanding that market, bring more value back to New Zealand, but it gives us access to things like the Horizon Fund out of Europe, which is one of the pillars is investing in food and responding to the climate adaptation. Uh, and that's a billion euros, I should say, in funding that we can tap into in theory and partnerships with others. So actually trade, that trade is going to help enable us to access um, and, and partner on innovation, which is going to be critically important to you know, continuing to grow value uh, and continuing to, you know, to, to, to grow produce, produce um, goods in a way which is better for the world. So I think it's opening us uh, opportunities up there. I think, you know, and there's a bunch of sort of, you know, good discussions there, but as we've talked about, I think we, we're, it is getting to the hard part. It is going to be harder now. And I think, too, you know, we, we need to recognise that for a long time we've done really well out of trade agreements with a weak hand. We don't have the, you know, we don't have the, you know, the, the minerals. We don't have the large markets. So Paul Van has got to go out there and say, look, give me a deal because we're good people. And I think, you know, in some markets we've, we've really benefited from, I think, uh, sort of external factors, so take China, they wanted to prove that they could do deals, same with the UK, Europe we could align on the sustainability side of things, they wanted to send a message that they could do deals um, on the right terms and a big sustainability focus there which we support, but what's next, you know, so if you think we don't have that much left to access, but also I think the world is, is becoming more divided, the sort of discussion on shared values is more constrained and you're seeing lots of the emerging economies saying, don't tell us how to think or how to behave or do it our own way, thank you very much. So that sort of removes one of the cards I think we've been able to play, which is this, um, you know, we will, you know, we're, you know we're, our values are aligned and these sorts of things. So, so what does that mean for the business community? I think we've got to be a bit more constructive and we've got to involve ourselves more in these discussions and essentially we've got to help give our trade negotiators more of a platform to, have to, to make these agreements. Uh, so I think India is a really good example of that. So we, uh, to be frank, we've sort of underinvested in India for a long time. For a few reasons, I think we had, you know, probably easier wins, correct me if I'm wrong, Vangeli, but we had sort of easier wins. India's known to be quite protectionist, but it is starting to open up. And we're starting to go, well, we, you know, we are willing to invest now, but we're coming from quite a ways behind. Australia's just signed a deal covering 80 odd percent of its exports to India, you know, where we're still sort of over there, really just sort of starting to warm up that conversation. So the business community has recognised all of this and said, well, what can we do to support it? So the India New Zealand Business Council put out a strategy last year, basically saying, here's how we think we need to invest in the relationship, uh, taking a leaf out of Australia's books in a lot of way, and that's investing across the relationship, recognising India's not going to roll over and give us an agreement. So how do we essentially build the trading, build the relationship over time, build the trading relationship over time, and then allow Van Galley and Co to go over there and say, look, you know, we, we do a lot of trade anyway, and actually we've proved that we're really good for your communities, therefore actually we think there's a reason to do a deal. So, so we're talking about investing you know, in diplomacy, so more investment in our diplomatic footprint in the area and cultural exchanges and soft diplomacy, bringing more you know, um, you know, Indian students over to New Zealand. And actually, I should give a shout out to, to soft diplomacy here. It can be one where you go, oh, really, does it add much value? Um, well, for cynical people like me, at least. But, um, but one of the uh, most influential people in India, um, I would say, uh, was um, over here recently a few years ago in the Sir Edmund Hillary Foundation scholarship. And we have a, we have a proposal to... Um, to, uh, Zespri has a proposal essentially to invest in India, uh, saying we are counter seasonal to your growers, uh, we grow a lot more kiwi fruit you know, than you, uh, you know, we can essentially help you to grow more fruit, um, get more of it to market and get more for it when it gets there. If you remove that 33% tariff, we will invest in developing this market. So we think it's a win-win across the board and essentially a pathfinder agreement for New Zealand. And we, got, and we can talk a bit more about that in a bit, but we essentially got stuck in the bureaucracy a little bit, uh, and this person sort of you know, rung up his colleagues in the ministries and said, look, this is a good proposal, get on with it and help move it along. So I think you know, that sort of focus on building those connections at high levels is really important. So, uh, so I think you know, business community really, and we have to recognise too, we have to be willing to invest to get something out of this agreement. You know, it's not just going to be opened up for us through, you know, through a deal which is being signed. We've got to show that we're willing to invest and build that relationship and then hopefully reap the rewards of that. Thank you, Michael. You'll be pleased to know that I fractured my ankle in the name of trade and investment uh, when I was in Tonga at the National Business Conference four weeks ago. Well, yeah, there's, there's a few different stories, but yes, there were definitely some, uh, some stray dogs involved in, uh, in the, exercise, the ultimate shaggy dog story. Um, uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Stephanie Honey. Uh, Stephanie is an alumni of the University of Auckland um, and has been involved with uh, trade policy and trade negotiations since the 1990s, particularly in the early um, part of her career with the World Trade Organisation, 
um, and, uh, and naturally uh, being from New Zealand around uh, agriculture in that space. Stephanie's the Managing Director of, um, of, Honey, of Honey Consulting Limited and that, uh, and that uh, facilitates her role in a number of different um, activities. She is the Chair of the New Zealand Horticulture Export Authority um, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we have uh, worked very closely together, particularly in the last 12 months, uh, with um, Stephanie's involvement as the lead staffer uh, for the APEC Business Advisory Council in New Zealand, supporting um, myself and my colleagues Anna Curzon and Rachel Tolele. Um, uh, but, uh, but Steph's involvement with, um, with ABAC is much wider than that because really um, she's one of the, the key people, uh, one of the key staffers that uh, really uh, drives the whole um, ABAC organisation. We meet four times a year. Three of those meetings are to formulate our recommendations to, uh, to the various portfolios um, within the APEC member economies and then also our um, recommendations to the leaders. And uh, when that drafting is happening and it's um, uh, complex and often contentious, uh, Stephanie is at the heart of that, uh, not just um, uh, advocating for our interests but making sure that we can't come up with statements that are coherent and fair for all of the participants within uh, within APEC, and that is no small task. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce, and I ask you to welcome, Stephanie Honey. Well, thanks very much, Brett. And may I just say, uh, Brett O'Reilly deserves a medal for services to New Zealand. Um, he was he became a, a you know very notorious, is perhaps not the right word, figure uh, zooming around on his knee scooter in San Francisco and, and you know, d really did New Zealand proud there. So thank you for your generous words and for your service, Brett. Um, so I, oh, sorry, just getting a phone call. It's my PR people on the line. Um, so I'm going to talk about digital trade and you might wonder why at an event about, you know, a sustainable future we're talking about digital. Well, I mean, Firstly, I, I love my digital, that's why I'm talking about it, but it's actually relevant to our work here today because um, digital technologies have an incredibly sort of potent uh, quality as a sort of force to drive more inclusive and more sustainable outcomes for the world. Um, I really do believe it can be a force for good and digital trade is, of course, at the sort of cutting edge of that. Um, equally, if we don't get it right, um, could potentially undermine inclusion and sustainability. So, uh, you know, it's a, a really important part of this conversation. And um, it's an interesting time for digital trade. We're really seeing the forces of fragmentation, consolidation and innovation kind of doing battle. Um, and because we're talking about sustainable futures, I thought I'd use a bit of a weather metaphor today. So I'm going to talk about a snowball, the doldrums, and a whirlwind, or actually maybe an earthquake is a better metaphor there, but you know it's only marginally climate related. Um, so let me let me go through this then. Um, the snowball, first of all, um, shout out to Van Gelly, uh, a, a great idea that he came up with a few years ago in partnership with Singapore and Chile, our co-conspirators on all great trade innovations. Um, was for a, a new kind of digital trade agreement, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. Um, and this was really a great example of innovative trade policy craft and um, concerted open pluralateralism as well. Essentially a model that moved away from what had gone before, which was a pretty um, once over lightly sort of model in traditional trade agreements, including TPP, CPTPP, um, and really bringing in some very fundamental concepts to enable digital trade around the importance of building trust, but also enabling end-to-end -end digital trade transactions. We, we sort of really need all the parts of the puzzle to work together to deliver those great outcomes for inclusion and sustainability and prosperity and growth. Um, and that was, you know, kind of really a product of the pandemic. It was negotiated virtually, signed virtually. Um, but I'm just delighted to say that over the last year, we've really seen the snowball rolling down the hill, gathering momentum. Um, and so we're starting to see other countries wanting to join the party. So 
Korea has now formally acceded to the agreement, which is wonderful. And there's a growing queue of countries who want to join as well, including some really important players in the space. So um, China is in the queue, Canada is in the queue, Peru, Costa Rica, UAE, am I missing any, Vangeli? Um, and, you know, I think as we can see this momentum building, there will be more because this is really an area where, unfortunately, the global trade landscape is very fragmented. There's a lot of siloed thinking, countries going their own way, and more than many other areas of trade or any other areas of trade, this is sort of a borderless global enterprise for businesses um, and, and for managing risk. And so we do really need a sort of global model, which I think deeper one day, you know, maybe in a few years we'll be saying, we remember when it was just the three of us and now uh, it's the model for a sort of global, global move. But let's not get too upbeat. Let's move to the doldrums because unfortunately in the last few weeks, um, and thanks the US for the timing, it's given me something to talk about here, um, we've seen a really significant move by the United States in this space. Now, the US was one of the instigators of the sort of modern, global digital trade uh, architecture, if you like. In TPP, it really pushed this idea that we need free flows of data. Now, why would you care about that? Well, it's really the lifeblood of digital trade. If you don't have data, you really don't have digital trade flows. Um, and so the US instigated this model, which was our default should be trade, uh, data should flow freely, with, of course, important policy safeguards built in, based on a kind of WTO gap model that where there are legitimate public policy uh, objectives that need to be met, they should, of course, you know, kind of modulate, qualify um, the free flow of data. And so the US has been a great champion of that. There's no secret that it's been driven by its big tech sort of economic interests, but also it's actually a really important enabler of small businesses, of women, of indigenous um, enterprise, that this is the way that digital trade happens most efficiently and effectively um, without those trade barriers. But unfortunately in the last few weeks, and you know, driven by some of the politics that Vangeli talked about, the US has decided and announced that it is no longer a supporter of free flows of data. The reason it's given is because it wants to create policy space. Um, it, it needs to have a rethink about, you know, where its interests lie and, and what it's actually trying to achieve. And in a way, it can't be faulted for that because in a lot of this stuff, we're really building the plane as we're flying it. We're starting to recognise emerging impacts and implications, whether economic or legal or technical. Um, so there's nothing wrong with taking a breath. But I must say, in terms of creating the architecture, I, I think it will have a really significant impact. We've already seen an IPF, um, it was signalling that it did not want to talk about data flows there, and IPF was going to be a deeper style approach to digital trade policy making in the region, a really important sort of bit of the, the, the picture there. Um, and also it has now announced that it's going to withdraw its support for data provisions in the WTO. There's a really important plurilateral happening there involving essentially most of the, the countries involved in digital trade, something like 90% of global trade. Um, and it will be interesting to see as they move towards the conclusion of that process, which was meant to be at the end of this year or maybe um, at MC13 next year, whether that's really taken the, the wind out of the sails we're in the doldrums. And then my last, my last area, the earthquake or the, the whirlwind, um, generative AI. Just show of hands, who here has used chat GPT? And actually, if I asked who's used AI and you didn't put your hand up, you would be wrong. It's in everything that we do these days. Whether you're, you know, booking your Air New Zealand flights or what, um, you know, algorithm, Spotify or Netflix or whatever shows you, it's in everything that we do these days. But generative AI is, is really um, a tectonic shift, if you like. Um, it's changing everything and it's got a really important symbiotic relationship with trade. Um, and a kind of two-way relationship. Trade uh, enables innovation, um, governance, access to data pools, which are the sort of the life force of generative AI, uptake, but also um, the way AI uh, can be used in trade is really important. 
to enable more efficient supply chains, for example, the delivery of digital services. Um, there's a, a really critical um, sort of cross-cutting importance for trade and AI and AI and trade. Um, but of course, we've seen this, you know, rampaging onto the global stage, um, generative AI, and many trade agreements, as with many other areas of digital trade, are really sort of scrambling to keep up. Regulators are often just developing regulation in their own economies, but um, of course, none of this is confined within national borders. Um, so there's a really important conversation that has to be had, and is starting to be had, in agreements like DEPA, but in, in other settings, including APEC as well. Um, so that's a really important thing. And just to mention very briefly, in the because I've just got back from San Francisco, a really important part of this is also around um, the hardware side. So, I mean, the relationship with trade is around services, data, people, you know, sort of specialised uh, digital um, uh, uh, technical specialists, but also the physical hardware. And one of the, the sort of absolutely critical enablers of AI is chips, and mostly using semiconductors, the, the vast majority of which are made in Taiwan, um, and extremely specialised. I mean, to give you a sense, a human hair is about 100,000 nanometres wide. Some of this next generation of chips that are sort of almost here, the ones that are here now are seven nanometres wide, the transistors in these chips. Um, the next generation will be four nanometres. So, I mean, this is super, super specialised stuff. They're all made in Taiwan, um, but the US and many other economies are now scrambling to, to essentially diversify supply chains and build their own domestic capabilities. So there's a, an incredibly interesting picture happening there as well, not only in data flows and regulation, but also in the sort of physical hardware that we need. And I've probably long gone over my, my five minutes. Um, but just one little thing that I think we were going to say, which is what's next, a very critical thing that's likely to happen at MC13, a, a sort of an existential question, if you like, for some aspects of digital trade, is around whether or not tariffs can be applied to it. I won't go into that in great detail, but let me just say it's something that could have quite a major impact on everything I've just talked about. Um, and New Zealand's, I think, on the side of the angels there, along with most of the rest of the world, but it's not a foregone conclusion that we'll get to the right outcome. So sorry for taking too long, Brett, but thanks very much. No need to apologise at all, Steph. So look, um, you can see we've got an incredibly experienced um, a panel here, and I really want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to, um, I've got a, um, plenty of questions I can ask the panel myself, but I'm keen to get them from, from you. So I'm just going to kick off with one question, and then I'd like to encourage you all to, to use the rest of our 30 minutes together to, um, to get those questions out on the table that you would, you would like and take advantage of having um, such a great panel together. So I'm, I'm, my question's about the World Trade Organization. Um, with you know, the stress on the multilateral rules-based trading system, are global bodies like the WTO still useful? And should New Zealand still focus its efforts on the World Trade Organization? And I might give each of the pa panelists a chance to to have a go at that, Sarah, why don't you uh, kick us off? Thank you. Great to kick this off sitting next to our former <laughs> um, ambassador to the WTO and WTO negotiator, but I'll, I'll give you my two cents worth as a start anyway. Look, I think historically the WTO has been very, very useful for New Zealand. It's locked in some fundamental rules of trade, it's given us um, guaranteed access to other countries' markets, and it's given us a mechanism to resolve certain types of disputes. But the WTO's usefulness right now is increasingly questionable. Uh, this is because of the deadlock in the Doha round of negotiations, which have been deadlocked for 20 years or so. The, um, the stagnation or the, the sort of, um, what's the word? Well, the WTO dispute settlement system doesn't work, hasn't worked for five years. And the WTO itself, it's questionable uh, whether it is able to deal with some of the challenges we've got coming down the road, in particular climate and digital that Steph's talked about. Um, so, look, while it would be preferable to have a WTO that is firing on all cylinders, I have to tell you that the world trading system is working without much assistance from the WTO right now. We have a proliferation of bilateral and regional trade agreements that are giving us new rules of trade, locking in improved market access, and giving us um, forum to settle disputes. 
and dispute, trade-related disputes are being resolved all the time. And it's really important to remember that 99.9% .9 of trade disputes are not about WTO rules, and they're not settled at the WTO. They're settled via negotiations, consultation, arbitration, mediation, litigation, national courts, ICS. I mean, there's so many different forums in which we settle disputes. It would be great to have the WTO to resolve a certain category of dispute, but at the end of the day, things are still working. So I think it will always be in New Zealand's interest to advocate for a strong WTO, but I think it is important, given things are working in many respects now, that we are careful in the um, resources we put into this and that they're commensurate with our likely returns on investment. <laughs> so the answer to your question is a yes and yes. And, and maybe to explain, is that on? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe to explain why. I mean, m many of you have heard me talk about the golden weather for New Zealand trade policy, and the start of that was the establishment of the World Trade Organization, um, 1st of January, 1995. A really important moment we should not forget, because for the first time, agricultural exports were brought into the rules-based trading system, and we had a system that could enforce our rights. So we were able to take, you know, major trading partners to court, win a case and then have um, uh, those major players, whether it was the United States, whether it was the <coughs> EU, whether it was Australia, bring their regimes into compliance. So it is re a really important kind of foundational rock uh, on which the rest of our, our system is, um, is built up. So there's the dispute settlement function. It is absolutely true that, um, yes, it is a much weaker um, section uh, function now because of um, the US's unwillingness to um, to join a consensus to reappoint the, the various judges who, or the appellate body members who sit on the, um, uh, who, who hear the appeals. So clearly, clearly there's a problem, but I think the other thing that the World Trade Organization does that is very important not to lose sight of is, is it deals with subsidies. It is really the only place that can deal with um, agricultural subsidies, and that is a major, so I totally agree with you on, on tariffs. Uh, they are, um, uh, in general, you know, the trend has been downwards, although there's been a, a spike recently. Um, if you're in the dairy and the beef sectors, though, I mean, there are some significant tariffs out there, and including in India, um, <laughs> still in the EU. So you've still got some, some real problems, but fundamentally the really big thing that we have not grappled with is, um, is subsidies. So the subsidies, the colossal sums that other countries are putting into their farmers uh, that we then, or the our exporters then have to compete with um, internationally. And I mean, the, the problem remains essentially the same. I mean, back in 1994, 1995, at the end of the Uruguay round, essentially two major players accounted for about 75% of global subsidies. It was the EU and the United States. Today, the figure's about 77%, and it's four economies. It's US, EU, so our, the usual suspects, China and India. And the trajectory of those is really up. That affects prices that affects the returns, that affects our living standards. So the, the urgency of grappling with that um, is, is, I think, really important. So the WTO is still the place to do that. It has done things, so it is absolutely correct that since you know the Doha lap round was launched in 2001, um, sometimes you can get a little bit depressed about, about what we've not done. But look, we have got the trade facilitation agreement. We did get the agreement to eliminate agricultural export subsidies. We've also got an agreement on fishery subsidies. Those are non-trivial outcomes in terms of where uh, New Zealand's inter interests lie. So that multilateral body still remains extremely important. And I think I, I agree with Steph on the e-commerce moratorium, the, the idea that people might be able to charge tariffs on digital trade. I think that would be catastrophic, not just commercially, but also in terms of the credibility of the institution. I think it would be very, very damaging if we fail at MC13 to roll over uh, the moratorium. And I, it's one of the things that I do worry about. So we do need to do something on e-commerce. As a minimum, roll that over. We need to finish the fish subsidies agreement. There's part two to be done. And then we do need to launch a proper negotiation on um, agricultural domestic support. And those are the things the World Trade Organization can really do and really do well. Um, so it is certainly the case that we do need to think about how we calibrate resource and where we invest. But I've got to say, for me, um, and maybe I reflect <laughs> my age, and, and origin, the WTO remains a really fundamental bedrock of, of our system. Um, and so I'm, we're, we're certainly not ready to abandon it. It was a long answer. Thanks, Fanny Gillis. Steph. 
Thank you. Um, well, I spent nine years working on Doha, so, you know, I, I um, agree with everything Van Gelly said, and Sarah, I'm sorry, but I don't really agree with a lot of, um, you know, your your sort of argumentation, because I think, in addition to what Van Gelly's talked about, um, there's a lot of the WTO's work that's not terribly glamorous, and, you know, frankly, I've never prayed more for a terrorist attack than, or a fire alarm or something than sitting through many hours of the Committee on Agriculture notifications process. But, um, you know, it does a lot of unsung work that is about transparency and building confidence between trade partners. There are lots of processes that are sort of around monitoring and, and transparency of, of people's policies. Um, which can generate those, you know, consultations and conversations that can resolve trade problems and sort of nip them in the bud. Um, and just on the negotiating function, I absolutely agree. It hasn't, uh, you know, been a great record for the last 20 years. Um, but I think, you know, we're moving into an era where there are lots of these sort of disruptive forces. There's a lot of uh, kind of emphasis on economic security and, and it's sort of a, a general ratcheting up of tensions and kind of adversarial attitudes in the trading system. Well, the WTO and like APEC is one place where lots of countries can actually come together and talk about things and not, you know, get out the gunboats. Um, and that's particularly acute. If you're not in the club of smart, active countries like New Zealand, but you might be in Africa or one of the, you know, other least developed countries or one of the poorer, you know, Pacific neighbours or so on. That is a forum where you have a seat at the table and a voice to essentially conduct your trade policy and, and that really matters. But also through a sort of global lens, I mean, we are now confronting these major global I don't think it's too strong to say existential challenges around sustainability and digital transformation. And the best place to develop rules for that is in a sort of global body. So I'm, I'm still on the WTO side. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I think the WTO that's been addressed, and fundamentally anything that puts us, a small country, on the same playing field as others is a good thing. Um, I, I think, to me, I suppose to address it slightly different, the gap in the settings, I think, is something around uh, sense making of the world. And you know, many of your students are probably getting it. It is a bit of a, a term of the moment, but essentially the world's really complicated and everyone's sitting there at their desks trying to figure it out themselves. You know, how's China changing and how's it going to affect us? How's Europe changing and how's it going to affect us? So, and it's you know, all right for big corporates, well, it's still hard for big corporates, but other exporters that don't have that same capacity or capability are sort of are doing a little bit harder. So I think. You know, and then you, and then you sort of, you know, you know take the next step you go, you know, Europe's changing really quickly. We, as exporters, we're having to respond really quickly to all of their regulatory requirements. We have our own regula regulatory changes in New Zealand. We export to a bunch of countries, and if, you know, change differences between China and Europe, for example, make our supply chain more complicated. Uh, and then you go, we have all of these issues that, as a world, we have to address. And I come back to food production, for example, but you can extrapolate that out across a bunch of industries. So let's take you know the, um, the, the, the Horizons Fund that I talked about before in Europe because they are taking away these products for their farmers and growers. They're investing truckloads in bio alternatives, things that are better for the environment. We're going to want them pretty quickly, but it's going to take years to get into, to get approval to get into New Zealand because they are, frankly, our regulators not set up to do it. So. How do we get alignment on these big initiatives where you go, you know what, um, you know, if, you can, if the product can be tested to these standards, uh, then it is okay for export to other markets. And if you're a manufacturer, you go, well, okay, if I do this, I can export it to Europe, I know I can export it to China, I know I can export it to New Zealand, to the 500 people there that will use it, but you get my point. It, they know the scale of their market and it's going to increase their willing to, willingness to invest in those sorts of issues. So I think that sense making and giving sort of manufacturers that confidence that actually the market will be there and it will be pretty large. You have to go all through all of these different regulatory processes. Um, I think if we can find a way to, to, to sort of align that, I think that's going to help us to address some of the big, big issues. Thanks, Michael. All right, some questions from the audience. Who wants to kick us off? Gary. Uh, so just, just wait for the microphone, Gary. There it is. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gary from the Indian New Zealand Business Council. This question is more uh, for Sarah. You, um, pointed out a very important thing about saying that maybe the era of multilateralism is 
not over, but I think, um, um, are you saying that bilateral uh, agreements will be more into play given uh, the change in geopolitical situation? And we see, um, I think that era of uh, big calm and peace is you know, getting shaken up. And, and you think that's why the bilateral agreements will be more into four in the coming years, yeah. So, thanks for the question, Gary. What I'm saying is bilateral trade agreements, we are getting to the point where much of New Zealand's trade is already covered by a bilateral trade agreement and the trade barriers that remain are going to be very difficult to overcome. But what I think we can do bilaterally, and particularly with India, is think about creative ways to create commercial opportunity outside the confines of a traditional FTA. So the Indian government, at its own initiative, is able to reduce a tariff on any product in a seasonal way or across the board, so long as it provides that access to everyone. And there may be a product that only we, we want to sell India. So if we can convince them we have something to offer, India might well reduce the tariff. So that's just one creative way to create commercial opportunities. I think we just need to, we need to be creative because there are other ways beyond multilateral, bilateral, regional trade agreements to create commercial opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. What about a question from this table here? There you go. I will put you all on the spot, so be, re be ready. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Liam from Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, I'm conscious that this year we released a strategic assessment, um, navigating a shifting world and assess that the period up until 2035 will be more uncertain and complex um, and that we will need to navigate a wider array of global threats. Um, so my question, probably mainly to Sarah, Steph and Michael is, are you also seeing these trends from your own viewpoint and what can the New Zealand government and exporters do to navigate these challenges. Thanks, Liam. Well, sorry to all the foreign affairs people in, in the room, but um, I was, what's the word, dismayed to see only a very glancing reference to digital transformation in that strategic outlook. Um, you may surmise that, you know, I, I don't think that's right. Um, I, I think that... New Zealand has managed to achieve a, a really sort of front-footed, interesting and, um, you know, um, uh, forward-leaning position on digital trade through DEPA, but I think it needs to be baked into everything we do because it is in everything we do. And, um, you know, one of the things that um, really concerns me is not only did it not really feature in that strategic assessment, but quite frankly, I think MFAT and other important departments that deal with digital trade in its various guises are really badly under-resourced for this. Um, you know, I, I strongly believe that the government whenever we have a government, um, should actually be investing in this. Um, we can be at the forefront because we've got the pedigree of being creative, smart thinkers who can be the honest broker and come up with good ideas, but we can't do it with one poor little, you know, broken MFAT staff member trying to run the world by themselves. So, you know, I, I think it, that's, a, that's a real lack in that strategic assessment, and I think it can be fixed, but it's going to need investment. Thanks. Sarah. Oh, look, just to endorse what Steph said, I do think on digital there's a lot we can do and it would create huge benefits for the New Zealand economy. And I think we probably need a digital czar within Cabinet who oversees and coordinates the various different government departments that have got a role to play here. But to your question, Liam, about... Um, the sort of uh, geopolitical risks and things we're facing. Uh, it has got a lot tougher out there for business, particularly in the last 10 years, to, to Michael's point earlier, really. And I've never, once upon a time, our kind of work was dealing with the general counsel and the sales director. Now we have senior leadership teams and boards that want to hear about geopolitical risk and some of these trade areas, um, issues that we're working on. We've got global conflicts that lead to trade disruptions, export controls, sanctions, really, really complex to navigate. We've got pandemics and uh, climate crises that are leading to, to disruption as well. I mean, it's, it's a really complicated environment out there, and I think business is having to be quite nimble to navigate that, and I think um, the government is doing a good job at trying to support where it can, but um, it is a very difficult environment, and I do think it's something that um, the government can really help business to, to navigate their way through. 
Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, I thought the document was, was good. It helps contextualise. You know, did, did do a good job of explaining sort of the challenges that we're facing across the world. And I, I, th I suppose I come back to those points earlier. Is you know, it's not going to be that easy for us as exporters. We've got to get more involved. Um, you know, we, you know, the business community, need, I think, needs to stay really aligned. Um, so, if we take India for example, um, you know, organisations like the Business Council and Brett's EMA uh, International Business Forum and others, uh, you know, we're working really hard to make sure that we present the government with a really clear, consistent view from the business business community uh, show that willingness to invest so the government can sort of, you know, help essentially go to India and show, look, we are willing to come here and invest. Uh, we are willing to be members of your communities. And I think that's really important. Like in, our, in the Zespri context, we operate in Europe. Um, and I know that it was helpful during the trade discussions there that, you know, we're, we're not just here to stale stuff. We're members of your community as well. So, you know, you're, you're sort of, you're shielding yourself a bit from um, from some of the, the, the turmoil and disruption because actually you are an active member and you're a contributor to those communities, which we are partnering with. Um, so I I think you know that willingness to invest um, on both sides uh, is really important to um, to helping us address it because, like I say, it just is getting harder and it is eroding confidence, and we've got to find ways to, to protect ourselves from that. All right, more questions, please. How, as you know, trade officials at MFAT, we should be using the small resources that we have um, in a trade context to try and address or um, put in place the framework to help with issues around and around climate change. And it's not just you know putting in place rules, but there's also opportunities, I guess, for business as well. So it's quite a big question, but interested in thoughts on on where um, MFAT, from particularly a trade perspective, should be you know thinking about climate issues. Thank you. Steph, do you want to go first? Um, thanks. Great question, Claire. Um, look, I think trade can be a real force for the climate, you know, finding climate solutions. Um, and MFAT is already quite engaged on a lot of this work. So, for example, liberalising trade in environmental goods and services is a really key enabler, not just of reducing emissions, but also adapting to a, a low a low carbon future. Um, some of the work that Brett's led and, and other colleagues in ABAC have worked on, um, which also, by the way, have a really significant commercial opportunity for New Zealand, are around things like trade and renewable energy. Um, there are a, a large number of uh, sort of the subsidy disciplines that, um, you know, fossil fuel subsidy reform, for example, is a, you know, an absolute no-brainer. It kind of beggars belief that we're still even having the conversation that the, the source of the major, you know, emissions is, is being subsidised by many governments around the world. So I think there's a lot there, but, you know, I, I think I would also counsel against um, a sort of a sense of despair about this because... You know, there's not only can trade be a force for good, but it's a really important potential commercial opportunity for New Zealand. I mean, for instance, in the environmental services space, we have some of the world leading companies, Becker and others, that could actually really shift the dial um, in this space if we can get the trade settings right. So I think it's actually a pretty exciting opportunity. Thanks. Uh, well, I suppose the first point is, is the business community needs to be advocating for you to get the resource you need to help address this, because for us as exporters and as just a populace, it's fundamental that we get it right. Do you know what I mean? It need, we need to... You know, we need, we need to do the right thing, uh, we need to address the crisis and we need to maintain our export market. So I think part of it is making sure as a business community we're making that clear so you've got the resources and not just MFAT but you know, the Environment Ministry across the board to tackle these issues. Um, you know, I think there probably is probably not quite enough of an understanding across the board of actually how fundamental it is to maintaining our market access. And if, you know, we are, it's not just, reg I've talked a lot about regulators offshore, but our customers are really driving it. And it's across the supply chain, it's sustainability in general, it's your, what's your carbon footprint, is your packaging recyclable, reusable, compostable, um, you, know, are you, um, you know, are you free of exploitation in your supply chain? All of these things are, are, are fundamental to accessing our largest customers, the biggest supermarkets and whatnot, uh, and also from consumers. And, you know, this one we've talked about for years, but we do a lot of research on understanding what consumers are focused on and really, really increasingly it's, it's hotter and hotter and it's food miles and it's being able to explain that actually, you know, yes, we might be shipping a long way away, but, um, you know, but actually here's our carbon footprint and we can back it up and show you what it is. For us, and I think, you know, the has been, you know, it's been, 
It's been useful in connecting, it's, it's been better in some areas than others to be frank, so one, one for example that come from transport and MFAT was around green shipping, so Zespri's carbon footprint is 47% shipping, because um, we're relatively, you know, a good on orchard and through the supply chain. Well, we can't fix shipping on our own, right? And as, a, as an exporting nation, actually we have to figure out how we're going to address this or it's going to become a problem for us. So, so we've been working with the government, um, working with our shipping partners actually, and making pretty good progress, and I know others like Fonterra are, are as well, um, but, it's, but it's a problem that the government's going to need to invest in, so infrastructure to enable the largest, ship, largest ships, which are, which are you know, carbon neutral, those sorts of things. Um, but I think, you know, we've just, yeah, it, it just is, and then working with us, so, you know, for example, we're at COP, um, with you know, with um, with the New Zealand dele delegation there, and the, the the key purpose for us being there is to find those like-minded partners um, from you know around the world who are willing to invest in these things, who might have techn technology or to enable our you know 100% reusable compostable um, recyclable packaging goals. So those sort of things. So enabling those partnerships is a really important one as well. Yeah, just just to add a couple of comments um, to to. Um uh, to what Michael said, um, when we were at, um, at the Apex Summit, there was quite a lot of discussion about green shipping corridors. So the Port of Los Angeles, which is the largest um, um, West Coast uh, import-export port in the United States, have, uh, have established green shipping corridors with, um, with, uh, with Singapore and I think with some of the major ports in China and looking at how they make that shipping as sustainable as possible, which, which was interesting. Michael also... Um, reminded me, um, one of the roles I play is as the co-chair of the Advanced Manufacturing Industry Transformation Plan, um, uh, which was initi initiated um, uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the questions we've asked ourselves in that, um, in that work, um, putting aside obviously manufacturing that's related to primary production, but how does the manufacturing sector look like when um, maybe many of our advanced manufactured products aren't manufactured in New Zealand. Um, so the IP stays here, but we look at alternative ways of developing that. When I was in India um, a couple of months ago, we visited Raycon's um, nano chip plant in, uh, in Bengaluru in the state of Karnataka in India, and, uh, and, and Raycon and many other New Zealand manufacturers are taking advantage of proximity to market, but also the opportunity to lower their um, uh, their carbon footprint by being as close as possible to the customer. So that, that's a very different way of us thinking about economic growth and thinking about trade from the, the way we've traditionally thought of it. Ben Gillis, anything to add on? Uh, on <laughs> yeah, now that you mention it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I just want to make two things. Um, one is to draw attention to the agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability. There's a team offshore right now negotiating that. Um, that, that's an agreement that's, I mean, I know you know it well, Claire, but for, for anyone else, um, it's an agreement that we, we're using a traditional trade agreement essentially to do some classical trade things, which is eliminate uh, tariffs on um, environmental goods, solar panels and that kind of thing, but also to try to remove barriers um, and lock in access for environmental services, so very much the classical piece. Some interesting things on some guidelines on private standards for eco-labelling. And then the third pillar of it, which I think is probably the most groundbreaking, is to try to use the trade agreement to discipline and reform fossil fuel subsidies, to go to your point, um, Steph. So here's an agreement, again, a small group of countries, Switzerland, uh, Iceland, New Zealand, Costa Rica, uh, who am I missing? Switzerland, Norway. Um, so the five of us have, have come together to do this. It will be an open plurilateral, so when we finish, which we hope will be a matter of uh, weeks and maybe some months away, um, it will be open to others to join. And again, it is about trying to say, here's a trade agreement. Trade agreement's not the silver bullet that's going to solve the climate crisis, but it should make a contribution. And here's a way it can do that. Cutting fossil fuel subsidies, eliminating tariffs on environmental goods, which makes the products cheaper for people to use. Then the other thing that we're thinking about internally is green economy agreements, which goes exactly to your um, green shipping corridors. And would go very much to what you've been talking about, sort of a non-traditional way of using a sort of a trade agreement concept, but looking at the green economy, what things do we need to work on together, uh, much more in that cooperative space rather than the disciplines and um, sanctions and fines, but much more in the, how do you make a green corridor work? How would you make sure that you get an advantage if you're a green exporter? How does that <laughs> fit in with our traditional trade rules? So lots of really interesting, challenging questions in there, but it's the kind of thing we're gonna need to be thinking about, and again, um, we're looking for small other partners that we can move ahead quickly with um, on those kinds of concepts. 
Thank you. We've got time for one final question. Who wants to depose it? Come on, don't be shy. You're all students of, of this. Here we are. Thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, sorry, it's a particularly uh, unintelligent question. But um, going back to sort of like the regu regulatory coherence piece, what's a value proposition for smaller or less developed countries with the you know, rise of protectionism, given that they see it work kind of for the big ones, US and China and... Looks like I've, I've, I've been given this one. So I, I think this regulatory piece and um, regulatory occurrence is really difficult. What we are seeing around the world is a proliferation of regulation, including in New Zealand, and it is making it difficult in some senses to do business. I think um, there are some people suggesting that we should try and have plurilaterals on regulations to try and negotiate things, but I just don't really think that's going to work. Generally, countries don't want to negotiate away their food safety standards and their health standards. I think what we, New Zealand, and what developing countries should try to push for is mutual recognition of regulations. So if I'm comfortable with your regulatory settings and you're comfortable with mine, we agree that we're going to trade products with each other without making our manufacturers and exporters meet the other country standards because that's hugely expensive. It creates all sorts of work for lawyers, but it's, it's hugely expensive and, and, and not ideal. So I think we can address in regulatory incoherence via mutual recognition in the first instance, I think. I would say it reduces cost to serve the market too. So, you know, every exporter is going, well, where am I going to send my product? You know, what, what are my routes to market? You know, what's my market access like? What's the customer base like? All of these sorts of questions. And, and, if, it, and if, it's a, you know, if, if those things are easier, if it's easier to get into that market because the regula regulations are right, then they're more likely to allocate their goods or services to that market. So it opens up what's available to them. And the flip side too is, you know, if, if you know, smaller, smaller countries with less ability to negotiate... You know, they don't have to allocate resources to addressing these things because actually, you know, there's a pathway for them. So, I would say some good benefit. I'd just like to add a nuance on one dimension of this, which is a sort of extraterritorial application of some regulation in two of the key areas that we've talked about, which is environment and digital. Um, you know, one of the the things that we've worked on this year in ABAC is the EU's new carbon border adjustment mechanism, where essentially a European regulation is, is uh, kind of setting the pace for compliance for lots of countries, or all other countries, but you know, uh, I think the, the sort of compliance burden is going to be particularly punishing on developing economies and small economies. Um, and you know, that, that, if I may say so, actually really makes the case for something like the WTO, because that is the way you could solve you know, the, the way that countries are now looking to regulate um, sort of pro-climate pro policies, if you like, um, without essentially imposing a, a, an unworkable compliance burden on smaller trading partners and more vulnerable trading partners. Um, the other piece is on digital, and I've done some um, quite interesting work for the Asian Development Bank in this area. Because, you know, for a, a rich country like New Zealand, we've got a pretty sophisticated regulatory setup. Um, we have a lot of the sort of foundational regulatory building blocks in place for the digital economy. But for many, many countries in Asia and the Pacific, they actually simply don't have things like electronic transactions framework or privacy laws or cyber security laws or policies. And that, that is actually a real problem because not only do they risk getting left behind, you know, kind of surfing the, the commercial opportunity and the growth opportunity, but it leaves them very vulnerable to some of the bad side, if you like, of digital, like cyber security threats and so on. So um, one of the things that the Asian Development Bank is advocating, um, you know, sort of based on the work that I did for them, is that maybe we should be thinking about reframing some of the aid for trade investment. Um, you know, there's been a lot that's gone into things like infrastructure and skills development. That's absolutely critical as well. But we actually really need to be helping with the sort of regulatory architecture in a lot of those countries too. Um, in the digital space, but maybe in, in some of those other areas, SPS or TBT as well. Thanks. Just, just very quickly, I mean, it's a great question, um, Joe. The, the observation I'd make to pick up on what people have just said, I mean, there, there's something known as the Brussels effect, 
which is the, the idea that the EU then sets a standard and the rest of the world kind of has to kind of lock into it. Um, I, think, I think we have something of an emerging challenge which, to the Brussels effect, which is um, in CPTPP, as we review the agreement, is there an opportunity there for us to be working together and to help us, and I'm thinking of New Zealand here, to have an opportunity to shape some of those norms and those standards that then there'll be gradually, as the Brussels effect withers, um, and I'm talking about over the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, that the, the norms and um, the guidelines and the principles that we might be able to develop in CPTP, of which there is already a foundation in the regulatory coherence chapter, um, that we look to, to pick that up. That then goes to the point you made about the, the mutual recognition and so on. I mean, one of the big challenges there is really the mutual recognition concept has only worked in two places, the EU and, and Australia and New Zealand. And that's kind of our, I mean, I think one of our big challenges for CER and the single economic market is what is its future and is there a way to take that mutual recognition concept out to some of our ASEAN partners, for example, with whom we do have a free trade agreement, um, and I know I've banged on about this for many, many years. I mean, I do see that as one of the opportunities is to dock ourselves into that ASEAN piece, but that, that, that's a vision that you really need to be thinking about 15 to 20 years. This isn't gonna be a quick thing because think of the amount of time you need to, to develop the confidence in each other that you trust the regulatory system sufficiently that you'd accept someone else's food standards. Um, so that just takes time, but I think that should certainly be the, the animating vision um, for the way in which we look at the future. Thank you. I want to thank you for that question because one of the things, uh, as uh, Stephanie talked about, we've been very conscious of at ABAC is making sure that some of those smaller non-APEC member economies don't get left behind. Having spent time in the Pacific Islands this year, you know, those, those countries who are, going to, are likely to be severely impacted by climate change are equally in a really difficult position to be able to do anything about it because of the, the limitations around trade and environmental goods and services. So um, we, we spend a bit of time just reminding the large economies that you know, while they may not be signatories to APEC, they, they are our neighbours, they, you know, they, they are dependent on us um, for, for a lot of, um, of this activity, so it's, uh, it's critically important. Look, I'm afraid with that we've run, run out of time for, for, uh, for questions. But I want you to join me in thanking this incredible panel. I've, I learn something every time I hear them speak. And just thank you to Liam um, for helping uh, put the panel together at uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And thank you to the University of Auckland for their work in facilitating this important discussion. Kia ora tato.